Hear now these words from Micah, the sixth chapter, verses six through eight, what God requires. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sins of my soul? He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? This is the word of God for the people of God. I bring you greetings from the Ohio Council of Churches, our 102-year-old ecumenical body in Ohio that brings together 17 denominations to live together and work together as a movement for unity, for justice, and for peace. I'm happy your denomination is one of those 17. During the summer of 2012, I enjoyed the privilege of helping my oldest daughter, Nia, who graduated from Shaker Heights High School in, near Cleveland, to narrow her choice of a college or university to which she would transfer from her out-of-state school. All totaled, we visited nine, count them, nine schools. Strolling on to each campus was informative for Nia, but nostalgic for me. For I became acutely reminiscent, not only of my own college days, but of the whole higher education enterprise itself. You see, the thing that captured me the most was the sense of freedom that one experiences the minute you know you are away from home with no parents watching your every move, with systems of accountability that are mostly virtual, carried out by telephone calls, email notes, texts, or believe it or not, even U.S. mail letters. All of a sudden you find yourself in a new world where freedom of choice is dominant. The whole experience of being away from home, be it on a college campus or just entering the world of work, is like standing in line at the Golden Corral or any other buffet restaurant where you choose exactly what you want and how much you want. Your doctor is not watching, and if you're lucky, neither is your spouse. <laughs> but when in college, a student is given a menu of course offerings that are determined by the student's major or career goals. Each major has two sets of courses that lead to the completion of a degree program. One category is called electives, courses that a student may choose out of personal interest, or maybe, just maybe, because they happen to be easy. However, in either case, electives are classes that are not essential, if you will, for graduation, and in some cases, may just be some kind of academic busy work. I recall taking two film classes at OU in Athens. They had nothing to do with my major. I just like watching movies. <laughs> Doesn't this sound good though? This freedom thing? Of course it does. We like this privilege of freedom in our country in particular. This 
this independence we claim for ourselves, where we decide our own direction and our own courses of action. This is our national story. It is often described in glowing and not so glowing terms, but always with romantic energy. No one tells me what to do. We are free to make our own choices, control our own destiny, break treaties, opt out of alliances. We are also free to accept a less than honest version of U.S. history and therefore embrace uncritical race theory. This freedom thing can be experienced, though, even in households of faith, in many denominations, including my own. There is freedom in church affairs, freedom in congregational life to function as we wish with no outside interference. Some among us call it autonomy. We can connect with other Christians if we want, and if we don't want, guess what? No worries. We're autonomous. This I call the scandal of North American, even mainline, if you will, Christianity. We often think we are exempt from being partners with other churches. We often think we're exempt from engaging in the ministry of social justice. While a student at Ohio U in Athens, an apartment dweller, went out one morning to check my mail. I put my hand deep inside my mailbox to retrieve my items. And as I did this, I immediately felt a stinging sensation, an electric shock feeling. And I yelled out. I'm sure my neighbors heard me. And I soon realized that no one has sent a memo to the hornet nesting in my mailbox that I was just trying to get my mail. No offense, but it stung me good nevertheless. Sometimes the freedom that we hold on to carries with it an unexpected sting. It can be the sting of social self-centeredness or the sting of social brokenness. But either way, the result is painful. Too many people live as speeding motorists in a congested neighborhood with no stop signs, no yield signs, and even no lanes. The only thing that seems to matter is the irrational need for speed. There's no time for yielding so that the promising young couple may, may make their way around us or into our lane. No interest in stopping to help the, the stranded elderly couple no desire to give a jump start to the stalled young family and no interest in getting out of the way for the ambulance who's coming by, going to a crash site and then to a hospital. But these in so many ways are byproducts of society's electives, electives at work. Some protect their elective to be exclusive in who they care for and spend time with. Others, though, hold fast to their prerogative to not be patient. It is their right to be reckless. In fact, some are old or young and restless, too bold and beautiful to care about yours and all my children. Too careless to understand that these actually are the days of our lives. <laughs> Too self-absorbed to follow any kind of guiding light. <laughs> and because of their recklessness, they'll send all of us to a social, political, and religious general hospital. 
I tell you, it's all painful to behold. My friends, it's painful to watch people aspire to be rich in things while choosing simultaneously to be poor in soul. Painful for some to be affluent, yet not impacted by the daily realities of those who get by on payday loans, who have no health insurance, who are underemployed, who are in crisis, not just daily, but hourly. You see, our freedom, like too much champagne, has gone to our collective societal head. It has intoxicated us and has given us a headache. We actually do need some kind of relief. But whether your painkiller lasts for four or eight hours, it is not enough. Whether your political party is in office for four or eight years, it is not enough. Our solution will not come from a laid-back liberalism, nor can it be found in concrete conservatism. And it is not residing in the meandering middle. And it doesn't matter how many prisons or casinos that are built, and they're one and the same when you think about it, they are not the solution. All of these are just anesthesia. Anesthesia is what they are. A life cluttered with elective social and religious busywork may make us feel good, but won't lead to societal progress. It won't produce a degree. It won't enable us to be mature as a people. It's just anesthesia that offers a temporary relief to the pain of systemic problems. But my friends, we don't need anesthesia. What we need across the land is an antidote. We need that which turns back the trends, heals the hurts, prevents more pain, and leads to social graduation, maturity, and change. The antidote comes when we complete the second and more urgent element of our success. They're called the core requirements of our major. If our major is about serving God and being faithful to God in this earthly realm, we have to know that there are some requirements involved. The requirements are spelled out here by this 8th century prophet an academic and social religious advisor named Micah, who spoke on behalf of a faithful God that God had a controversy. God had a problem with the way Israel had been living. Micah called the people a drunk with freedom people, idolatrous, reckless, but he called them anyway to be grateful for what God had done for them, to remember God's liberating actions for Israel and how God gave them their freedom and their salvation and called them into real and authentic relationships, ones that move past the electives of false ritual worship and the empty sacrifice of precious possessions into the requirements through which they take on a new identity as people who honor God by doing justice, loving kindness, and walking humbly with their God. Doing justice for God meant taking care of the vulnerable, the orphans, the widows, and the sick, all who were often blamed for their own problems, while those in power simply 
increase their power. Do not profit from their misery, the prophet says. If you unjustly profited from their labors, pay them back. Give them their reparations. Love kindness. In other words, be merciful. Look beyond people's faults and see their needs. See that they were made in the image and likeness of God and are therefore valuable as is, just as they are. Well, you see, this is exactly what God did for Israel when it was in bondage in Egypt. These were the requirements for Israel from their loving God. And there's one more, to walk humbly with God, remembering that God is God and Israel is not. If we take Micah's advice seriously, we then purposefully reject the sin of autonomy and the flawed social contract and mythology of rugged individualism because we acknowledge that our futures are inextricably woven together and that for us every day is interdependence day because we need each other to survive. This we do because we know that pleasing God is not just about what we give, but also about what we do that conveys love, confers dignity, and confirms the worth of God on all people, especially those who have been locked out, not just of the American dream, but also of God's dream of wholeness, sometimes because of self-inflicted wounds, and other times because of the unjust actions of policymakers and those in power. Do justice. In other words, commit to the kind of work individually and collectively that makes wrong things right. Love kindness. Practice random acts of kindness, not because our neighbors always deserve them, sometimes they don't. But our kindness is not based on the action of others alone, but based upon who we are, who we say we are, who we believe we are, and our commitment, therefore, to craft a world where people are treated with dignity and honor and respect moving away from assumptions and stereotypes into authentic partnerships with people who are different than us. I am convinced that we have the power to complete these requirements. This is how I know. Every school day when our children were in classrooms, I watched motorists on their way to and from work drive past school buildings. Now, if you want to see the need for speed, look for people who are on their way to or from work. They're often flying on earth. Yet even in their busy and fast-paced commutes, once they look up, and, and see the flashing school zone lights, just automatically they slow down their cars to the 15 mile an hour speed limit. They do this now certainly to avoid getting a ticket, but more importantly, to create and preserve a zone through which children, our great and vulnerable social treasure, may walk and run and play safely. In other words, people are slowing down enough because they care. Not all of us, my friends, will ever have a day named in our honor. 
We may never have a school named after us either or see our names in the headlines of the newspaper. Probably a good thing. But we can still be great because you and I can do great things. And the great things that we can do involve slowing down enough to take someone else seriously and to create and preserve public health and safety practices that enable everybody to be served and protected, given health care, and are well educated regardless of their race or sex or age or zip code or who they love or how they love. So then, in our quest to be faithful to God, we must proclaim to our neighbors, here and now, slow down long enough to care for somebody. Slow down long enough to help somebody. Slow down long enough to stand with somebody. Slow down long enough to march with somebody. Slow down long enough that we may collectively embody the immortal words of Father Peter Schultze declaring that we will work with each other, we'll work side by side, and we'll guard each one's dignity and save each one's pride. And the world will know we are Christians not because we have organs with pipes or stained glass windows, but they'll know we are Christians by our love by our love, yes, they'll know that we are Christians by our love. Amen. Amen.